Welcome, everybody, to the online campus of Simple Church. My name is Jason. I'm the next-gen pastor here, and we're just so excited if you've decided to join us, especially if it's your first time. And if it is your first time, feel free to say hi in the chat box. We would love to get to know you. Now, before we jump into the, the message, if you call Simple Church your home or have been regularly attending this online campus, take an opportunity to invite your friends and your family by directing them to attend church dot online, or using the share button along the bottom of your screen. Do that now. Give people the opportunity to, to connect with the presence of God. While they do that, let me just give you a tour of our online campus, especially if you're joining us for the first time. Over here, you have an opportunity to give. If the Lord moves on your heart to give, you can do so by clicking Give Online. In the same area, you can fill out a Connect card if you'd like to connect with us. Tell us your story. Tell us your thoughts. Submit your prayer requests. If you want more information on joining a growth track or a grow group, maybe you're interested in serving. You can do all that on a Connect card. Lastly, we have a link to our community support page. If you're in need of any resources for social work or counseling, next steps, or anything else, you can access the form right there. Over here on the right, we have the chat box. We have our message notes, kids content, and a Bible for you. Down here, you can click on Request Prayer, and one of our hosts or our pastors will join you for a private live prayer session. Now, here's what's going to happen next. Today, in a moment, we will enter into a time of worship. Then we'll jump right into the message. Now, at this time, wherever you are, stand if you can, turn your speakers up, lift your hands, and sing your praises to our Heavenly Father. Let's go. Well, good morning, Simple Church. I'm glad that you guys are able to join us from wherever you're at. So at this moment, I ask you, just get into a posture of worship. Help us worship the Lord our God. Oh, you never fail. No, you don't. Walking around. I thought, I thought by now they'd fall. Oh, oh, oh for you I have never failed me. Waiting for change. Waiting for change to come. Knowing the battle, yeah. Still stand great. Your faithfulness. I'm still here. This is yeah. I know the night, I know the night will night. Your will come, my heart will sing, yeah.
never fail. Oh, oh, oh. oh you never felt me yet, no. Sing it out. What's up, everybody? Welcome back. My name is Aaron. I'm the lead pastor here. I want to say thanks again for being with us today. Hope you enjoyed that time of worship and, man, that you felt the presence of God. Uh, today, we are, uh, it is like the day after Independence Day. So hopefully this weekend, you guys have had uh, such an incredible time. Like, I'm, I'm hoping that things are better in your city than they are in my city. And not that things are bad here. It's just that, man, the fireworks are canceled. The parade is canceled. It's just like, all the things that we normally do got canceled. And even though things may be canceled, even though the, some of the traditions that you normally do with your friends and your family may be shut down this year, my encouragement to you is to find a way to make this weekend special. Like, go make sure you're connecting with people. Make sure you're connecting with your family, your friends, and you do something special. Because, man, I know this, that, that your kids will either remember coronavirus and this season that everything was shut down, or they'll remember how you went the extra mile to make things special during this time. 
despite the fact that there was a pandemic going on. So that's my encouragement to you. I hope you guys have had a hot dog and that you're grilling out this weekend and getting lots of time with family. So enjoy uh, Independence Day weekend and uh, happy 4th of July, everybody. Also want to take just a moment. This weekend is our first uh, weekend of watch parties. So if you are out there in a watch party, we want to say hello to you. Uh, this is really surreal because I'm filming a couple days early. So it's, uh, it's like I'm going to be saying hello to my own watch party, like to myself. I wonder if I'll be wearing the same thing. Hmm. Anyway, hi to all of our watch parties. You can join those. We'll share the link later on to tell you how you can be in a watch party. It's just a, a gathering of people that are getting together to watch Sunday morning service since we aren't able to be in our building together. And they're doing it all according to CDC guidelines and safely and wearing masks. Those things are optional in certain places and, and uh, just celebrating what God is doing together and fellowshipping and, uh, and enjoying worship uh, and the message together. So, you can get into a watch party. We'll share a link for you later. You can check our website for that as well. Also, man, really want to celebrate this summer. Uh, is really been huge for us. We have an amazing opportunity where we've partnered with the Dream Center and the Children's Hunger Alliance, and we have a feeding program that we do Monday through Friday from 5.30 to 6 p.m. right off of Bryce and Livingston here in our city. And we are showing up to uh, this, this apartment community, and we are serving meals to kids ages 0 to 18. And that has been a tremendous success so far. We are learning lots about it. So far, we've given 167 meals to kids. And man, that is just such a blessing. Uh, what a wonderful time that has been. And I know that that program is continuing to grow. Uh, and so thank you for being part of that. You can sign up for that as well. You can look on our website for that. Or we'll be sharing the links here uh, towards the end of the message. So stay tuned for that. Today, we are continuing our summer series, and I'm excited. Today's, the title of today's message is Liar, Liar. And uh, some of you are like, uh-oh, what are we going to talk about? Well, let me tell you what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about Satan. That's right. You have an enemy of your soul, and his name is Satan. Now, the greatest trick that Satan has ever pulled is trying to convince the masses that he does not exist. But let me tell you something. He does exist, and he is in direct opposition to your life. In fact, Satan, we have images of him that he's red, and he's got horns, and hooves, and a pitchfork, and throughout the ages, I feel like we have approached the subject of Satan, and the, more specifically, the person of Satan, as if he is somebody to be feared. In fact, we've used Satan not only to, to uh, say, all right, well, I'm afraid to do this, but we've also blamed a lot of things on him. Like, you know, well, my, well, my car broke down on the side of the road, and, and, and it's just the devil. It's just the devil coming at me. And it's like, no, it, it's not the devil. You forgot to put gas in your tank. Or, you know, we, we blame everything on him as if he has all power and all authority and all dominion and all control over your life. The truth is, is, if you were to look at Scripture, you would find that he, though he is your enemy, is not to be feared. I would say that Satan is more a character to be understood. Because when you understand who he is and you know the truth about him, the Bible says when you know the truth, the truth sets you free. Sets you free for what? Sets you free to live a full and fulfilled life that God has for you here on this earth. Sets you free to walk out your potential. Sets you free to do so many things. So let's just take a look at this character known as Satan. First, I want to take you to Isaiah 14. And Isaiah is giving a description of Satan. If you start at verse 12, it talks about his fall from heaven. And there's a whole bunch of things Satan says he's going to do. He makes these I will statements. And, and it's really indicative of who he is and really the cause of his fall, which was pride. That, that he talked a big game. He exalted himself. He talked about climbing the ladder of success, saying, I will ascend to the heavens, and I'll sit on the throne, and I'll be like the Almighty, like that he would be like God. But as we see his story play out, we see that God's like, devil, you failed at art school, and you're a liar. Boom, roasted. Also, we see him show up Mari Povich style and say, Satan, the results are in it, and we determine you are the father. You're the father of lies. Like, listen, we've lived in fear of this guy for generations, but Isaiah 14 describes somebody that we should not be afraid of. It says this, that, that we would ultimately see him, like when we get to see him, that we would be in wonder about what it is that we fear. Check it out. Isaiah 14, verses 16 through 17 says, Those who see you will stare. They will ponder your fate. 
Is this the man who shook the earth and made the kingdoms tremble, who turned the world into a desert and destroyed its cities, who refused to let the captives return to their homes? Man, sounds like the devil's got a complex, like he's compensating for being so weak by talking such a big game, because that's literally all he has. He has no power. He has no authority. He has no dominion. In fact, the Bible says that the work that Jesus accomplished here on this earth, when he lived a perfect and sinless life, died and was murdered on the cross and rose from the dead, that the work Jesus did there defeated the enemy. In fact, Ephesians 4, 8 says this, Therefore, he says, this is saying about Jesus, he says, when he descended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now, that captivity captive is a direct reference to Satan, that dude's already defeated. He's already been beat. And if the devil is already defeated by the completed work of Jesus on the cross, that means that he has been led captive. Have you ever seen like a chain gang walking down the road? Maybe you've seen old movies or you, maybe you watch too much crime TV, but you've seen them on TV. They got their hands, they got their feet shackled, and there's a chain that's connecting them in between. They are bound. They are powerless. They can't do anything of their own volition. But what they can do, one thing that isn't bound is their flapping tongues, and it's the same with Satan. In fact, that is the thing that is what gives him power. Because it says this in, about him in John 8, 40, 8, 44, excuse me. He has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it's consistent with his character for he is a liar and the father of lies. In other words, when he's talking, he's lying because there's absolutely no truth in this guy. And because there's no truth in him, we understand that is where his power comes from. Because lies are powerful things, man. When we have bought into a lie, it, it ultimately shapes our behavior. It can shape our future. It can shape how we act now and either limit us or set us free. And so lies are a powerful thing. And, and Satan it's his love, it's, it is his language, not his love language, excuse me, but it is consistent with his character. It's the only way he knows how to talk. He can't say anything that is a lie. So therein is his power. If you were to, to be aware of any kind of thing that he can use against you, it certainly isn't dominion and authority. It's the power of a lie. And you say, Aaron, why would Satan want to lie to me? What is his reason behind doing that? Well, it's the same reason all of us lie. We ultimately lie because we want control. We want control over the outcome of something that is linked to our fear of the potential of the truth being known. See, we fear, and the reason we lie as humans is because we fear, like, if I tell you the truth, if I tell you the truth about what happened, if I tell you the truth about what I said, if I tell you the truth, I'm afraid that I'll lose. I'm afraid that you will. I'm afraid of the consequences. I'm afraid of loss I'm afraid of pain, so I'm going to lie. And that lie is told in order to control the outcome of a situation. And Satan wants to lie too. The fact of the matter is the devil is afraid of you. He's afraid of you knowing the truth. Because of the impact that your life can make, because of the potential that you have, he fears you knowing the truth. He fears you knowing the truth about him, he fears you knowing the truth about God. He fears you knowing the truth about yourself. So he lies to control the outcome of your life, to limit your potential. In fact, John 10, 10, Jesus talking about him, saying the thief, this is again talking about Satan, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And the way that he does that is not that he literally puts his hands on you, not that he literally chokes you out to kill you, or that he can actually rob anything from you. The way that he does those three things is through one method alone, and it's lying. He lies, and he wants to destroy your life. He wants to destroy your, your potential. He wants to destroy your impact. He wants to destroy your relationships, your marriage, all through the power of lies. And there's a couple ways that he lies, and it's the same way that we lie as well. We'll, we'll omit the truth, like we'll tell part of the truth. Like I've done that before. Like, like my wife's like, did you order a pizza? Yeah. How much did you eat? Oh, I had two slices. Truth is I had four slices, but it also is true that I had two. So I'm omitting the full truth, which becomes a lie. Or we deny the truth, right? So, so Satan will omit some truth 
or he'll deny some truth. In other words, that whatever is true, he'll absolutely say the, other, the, other, the opposite side of it is true. Or we can exaggerate the truth. Like we just, I just told you, we had 167 meals. And I want that to be really, really awesome for you. And I'm tempted to exaggerate the truth and tell you, we've had a million meals served in less than three weeks. Like I want to tell you that. It's just not true. The truth is we've done 167 or whatever the number was I just told you a moment ago, right? But, but we tend to omit, we tend to deny, and we tend to exaggerate the truth. And we see these things, three things play out with Satan from the very beginning. In Genesis chapter 3 with Adam and Eve, the serpent comes to Eve, and of course the serpent is Satan in, the, in, the, in that form. And he asks her three questions. He gives her three lies. And she's, he's like trying to get her to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and she just won't do it. And he starts questioning and lying to her. He says, did God really say that? You won't die, which is a total denial of the truth. If she did eat of the the fruit, she would die. Uh, And God did really say that. And then he says, you will be like God. Which, by the way, for Eve who walked with God, that was an honorable desire. But that's not exactly what he meant, nor is it exactly what would happen. Uh, it's so, so, so he exaggerates the truth, he denies the truth, he omits some truth, and you know what happened from there. Eve, of course, eats the fruit, and then she gives it to her husband. God shows up on the scene, and they're kicked out of the garden because this was the, officially the fall of man. The very first man and woman had sinned, and they, sin had entered into the world. They get kicked out of the garden, and then curse falls on all of creation as a result of it, and then enters our need immediately for a Savior. And what Satan did in the garden... He's still trying to do today. He may not appear physically to speak to you, but he'll speak to you in your mind. He'll, he'll speak to your thoughts, or he'll speak to you through others. And that's why it's so important that we learn to expose the lies. Because if we expose the lies of the enemy, we take away his number one weapon. Today, my goal is to show you exactly how to do that. It's one point. It's easy to do. And, I, and I'm going to show you what happens if you will learn to expose the lies. And I'm going to do that through the lens of a story of a great character in the Bible. His name is Gideon. And uh, here's, here's the scene for Gideon. Gideon shows up in the Old Testament, and he shows up after Moses, but before uh, the kings. So like King David and King Saul. Uh, and he shows up in a time where there was, there was no ruler. There was no, uh, there was no main prophet who ruled like Moses. He was a main character who guided and shepherded the people There was no main character like that. Moses had died, Joshua had died, and now the Bible says that during this time that everyone did as they saw fit. So so there there, there was unspoken laws in the the land that people honored, but but they basically did as they saw fit. They governed themselves. And throughout judges, these judges that were appointed, these these people uh, would show up throughout uh, this history, uh, Gideon, who was a judge, would show up because there was no there was no leader or shepherd like like Samuel there was no or uh, like uh, Moses excuse me and no king God would appoint judges from time to time because the Israelite people would wander away from God and they would fall into sin and they would they would break their relationship with him and so God would allow them to be attacked and to be oppressed and and then the people would return to God they would repent and God would appoint a judge to deliver them all right so Throughout the book of Judges that is in the Old Testament, there are 14 judges, and there's three different kinds. There's the priest, which would be somebody like Samuel. There was prophet judges, which would be somebody like Deborah. And then there are warrior judges, which one of the most famous ones is Samson. You know Samson, the guy with the long hair and um, uh, who, who, who defeated all the Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey? Like He's legendary. And then there's this other guy named Gideon, who was also a warrior judge. Now, you need to know this, that Gideon was a farmer. And this is important to know because of where we pick up the story and what we know about Gideon. But during this time period, there was a people group called the Midianites, and the Midianites were attacking the Israelites. And they didn't just attack them for sport. They always came in during the harvest season to take away uh, uh, everything that they had grown and everything that they had harvested, and they would let them get it, and they would let them take it out of the fields, and then they would rob, rob them of it, and then they would leave them alone until harvest season came along again. And so this oppression of the Israelites went on for years. They would steal the crops, and then they would destroy the rest of the fields, so there was literally nothing left over for the Israelites, that they would have nothing to show 
for all their hard work. And then the people began to call out to God. God sends a prophet and says, hey, this, is the, the, this time is coming to the end. And this is where we step onto the scene with God sending his angel to call Gideon to fight. Now, if we, if we look into Gideon's story, we find that there were three lies that, that is very, very apparent in Gideon's life that he had to identify and expose in order to live out his potential and walk with God, right? Three lies uh, that he had to overcome in order to not only live out his purpose, but to make the difference that God was calling him to do. So let's pick up in Judges chapter 6, verses 11 through 13. And it says this, Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. Now just pause there for a second. Gideon is, has, has harvested his wheat, and he's in this wine press. He's at the bottom of it. He's hiding. He's hiding from the Midianites because typically threshing wheat, which is, which is separating the chaff from the wheat, the good part from the bad part, would be done at the top of the hill, and they would thresh it so that the chaff would be carried away by the wind. It's easy-peasy cleanup. I like that kind of approach. But here's Gideon. He's hiding in a wine press, hunkered down, and he's threshing his wheat so that the Midianites wouldn't see that he, is, that he was threshing his wheat and attack him and take his wine from him. All right, so that's the scene. Everybody is scared, including Gideon. And it says, the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Good question. And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say, the Lord brought us up out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. So as we look at that first verse, the very first lie that Gideon has got to overcome if he's going to do what God's called him to do is that God doesn't care for me. See, Gideon believed in the God of the past, the God that did miracles through Moses that delivered all the Israelites from Egypt and you know, is the one who did all the plagues on the Egyptians that got them convinced to let the, the Israelites go. And then they're the ones that crossed, crossed the Red Sea on dry land and then led them through the, the, the wilderness to the promised land. And, and, and Joshua, who conquered all the tribes in the, in the promised land so that the Israelites could take it over. But he believed in that God. But today, Gideon's looking at his current circumstances. He's living in oppression. And he has come to believe that God didn't care about him. And I don't know about you, but I feel like sometimes we get ourselves in a situation like that. I, I don't know if it's a health issue where sickness sets in and we see that other people have gotten healed in the past or maybe somebody you know has come through cancer or come through a situation that you're facing right now and you're just not. You're, you're, you're still in the middle of that thing. Or maybe, maybe you've got an issue with your kids that you expected to be resolved right now that it is, has caused a great chasm and a divide between you and you don't even know why it exists you can't even remember what caused it and you want it you pray for it to end and it continues to go on without end or maybe 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 your heart is continuing to break because you long for and desire a child and it seems like God is withholding this from you 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 come to believe God doesn't care about me or maybe 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 it's your finances you've worked so hard to put things together and to 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 save up money and just stuff keeps happening life keeps handing you issues that all the money you've saved up you keep having to roll out and your debt isn't going anywhere and you're just struggling i think we find ourselves in those situations and we find ourselves in that season for so long that we begin to believe we'll listen to the lies that the enemy speaks to us that god doesn't care about us and the reason he wants you to believe that is because it ultimately disqualifies you from the kind of relationship that God wants you to have with him, which is comes down to a partnership. See, the relationship God designed for you and I is a covenant relationship in the same way that a marriage relationship is established. We are set up to be partners with each other, to love each other in that way, but it's a partnership. And I believe the devil wants you to feel disqualified from that partnership. And if he can get you to believe that God doesn't care, then he'll win. If he can't get you to believe this one, if he can't get it to sink in, then he'll try another lie. And the second lie that we see here plays out in verses 14 through 15, same chapter 6. It says, Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I'm sending you. But, the Lord, but Lord Gideon replied, How can I rescue Israel? Watch this. Here's the lies. My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I'm the least in my entire family. Now put a pin in this for just a second. 
First of all, you need to understand that, that, that God chose a people and he chose a man named Abraham and he said, through you, I'm gonna bless all the nations of the world. Abraham had a son, his name was Isaac. Isaac had a son named Jacob, whose name was later changed to Israel. That's right, that's where we get the name Israelites. The whole Jewish people stem from these guys, from Abraham, all right? And, and so Jacob has many sons and one of his sons' names, uh, his, his grandchildren's name was Manasseh. Well, Manasseh becomes what they call like a half-tribe, all right? A half-tribe of Israel. They're honored as a half-tribe since Joseph's family was not, all right? That's a big, long history there, but you just need to know it was a tribe of Israel, all right? So there's a family group of Israel. And for whatever reason, Gideon believed that his family, his clan, was the weakest, now, you have to know that outside voices are the ones that spoke that over him. That maybe at some point in time they said, you know, you're the long. You're never going to amount to anything. Or that your family is from the wrong side of the tracks. Or that what your grandfather did has given you like a burden to bear for the rest of your life, almost like a curse. Or you're a, you come from a long lineage of alcoholics and you're never going to be free from alcoholism. You're going to make the same mistakes your parents have made. That, that for whatever reason, somebody has spoken something over you because of your family. And Gideon ultimately believed a lie about his potential due to outside voices about his family. But this problem goes deeper than that because look at the second thing he believed about himself. The second lie he believed due to the voices within his family was, that, was this, I am the least. I am the least of my family. He said, my clan's the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh and I'm the least in my entire family. Man, that's painful because I think every single one of us can identify with a family member or somebody really close in our lives who said something just like that to us. And it became something that defined us. It became something that we believed. It was a lie that was spoken over us. Maybe they spoke it out of, out of anger and so, or some other kind of emotion, or maybe, maybe they spoke it because nobody ever talked nice to them and they didn't know how to be very loving. Like whatever the situation is, they spoke something over us that has become a label that we've put on our life that ultimately has disqualified us. Maybe they said something like, you're nothing, or I wish you were never born, or you're stupid, or you're too dumb, or you're too whatever, fill in the blank, that you'll never fill in the blank. We come to believe that we are weak, stupid, and incapable because of something somebody close to us said about us. We all carry hurts from these kinds of lies that are spoken over us, and I believe the devil wants us to believe this lie because they disqualify us from our potential. That's right. And they, the big lie that we believe here is that God can't use me. And this is what Gideon had to overcome. The devil's gonna try to rob you by lying to you of your partnership and your potential. And if this won't stick, he'll try another lie. Check it out, Judges chapter six, same chapter, verses 17 through 18. Gideon replied, if you're truly gonna help me, show me a sign to prove that it was really the Lord speaking to me. So what Gideon does is he gives an offering. There's this angel sitting in front of him, which, by the way, that's a freak-out moment as it is. Like, the Bible tells us that when angels appeared on the scenes, they were, they were terrifying. And here Gideon is just offering. He's not even scared. He's not afraid to push back because he's so deeply ingrained in these lies. And so he says, all right, I'm going to test you a bit. And he says, give me a sign. So he prepares a meal, and he puts it on a rock in front of this angel. And the angel takes his staff, touches it, boom, the thing goes up in flames. And in this moment, Gideon has realized, holy cow, I've had an encounter with God. And, and I think that's what we all need at some point in time to shake us out of the fog of the lies that we believed is to have an encounter with God. That's why we do our worship services. Even though we're not meeting together, we still have these online services because we believe that no matter where you are, the power of God will meet you right there in your house. We had that happen this past Sunday during one of our worship sessions, man. We were just sitting around some musicians and singers and just worshiping God. We had it broadcasted live out and we had a woman uh, from another country respond, man, dedicate her life to Christ and say, I'm, I'm, Jesus, I'm coming home. Like that's a, that's a short summarization of it, but I'm telling you the power of God transcends this very building and will meet you right where you're at. We need an encounter with God and Gideon got one, man. He got one. The fog was lifted from his eyes. And, uh, and all of a sudden, he, he starts freaking out. He thinks he's gonna die. He's like, I'm undone. This is, this is crazy. 
And he becomes very zealous after this encounter with God. And he realizes, holy cow, there's a lot of people around me that are not worshiping the, the uppercase G God. They're worshiping a lot of lowercase G God, which is just the, the made up gods of the people, of the culture, of the land. And he goes around and he, and he starts ripping down these, these altars that were built to a lowercase g god named Baal and another thing called Asherah poles, which were, were, which were believed that if you put these poles up, then, then you'd have a, a fertile harvest and, and, and that your women would bear children. It means exactly what you think it means, by the way. And, uh, and he rips all these down. And during this time, what happens is that the Midianites are now invading. Why are they invading? Well, it's, it's harvest season, okay? So... So, so Gideon has this, this revival in his heart because he encounters God. The fog drifts away, but he still is having trouble uh, uh, trusting God. But, but the Spirit of God comes on him, right? Comes on him, and you need to know that the Midianite army shows up with 135,000 men to, 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 to steal all the, all the grain and to destroy all the fields and then be on their way. And, uh, and, and they're moving across the country at this point. And God's spirit comes on Gideon and he rallies an army and he rallies 32,000 men. Even with these 32,000 men, note that the army is 135,000 uh, that, that is his opponent. That, that's a chasm of a difference. 100,000 plus that they had more than him. And so Gideon is still struggling about God being with him, right? And, and that's, that's ultimately the big, the big lie here was that Gideon didn't believe that God was gonna be with him, that, that God isn't with me. And so he tests God. And what he does is he says, okay, God, here's what I'm gonna do. I need to know that you're with me. I've got this fleece here. So imagine you got this North Face jacket, all right? And you, want, and you throw it out on the ground and you tell God, hey, God, the dew that comes up on the ground in the morning, I want it to be everywhere on the ground, but just not on the jacket. And God says, done. Whole day goes by. He wakes up in the morning and the jacket's not wet, but the ground is. Gideon still ain't buying it. And he says, okay, God, here's what I want you to do. That same North Face, tomorrow morning, I want there to be dew on the North Face, but I want there to be nothing all on the ground all around it. And God says, done. The next morning, Gideon gets up. Two days have now passed. And God shows himself faithful because exactly what he asked for happens. Now, I have no idea why Gideon thought this was a good idea or a way to test God. Me, I'd have been like, okay, God, if a Chipotle burrito shows up at my door that I didn't order, then I'll believe you, right? Like, I think I just would have gone a little more uh, materialistic and maybe, maybe had it be something that I wanted. But, but Gideon's got this fleece. He's got his north face that he's throwing on the ground, and he's testing the Lord. Now, I want you to know this. God has called him to do this, to defeat this army, and Gideon's delayed two days. And what we see that happens later on is that the Midianite army is coming across Israel. And what's happened is his, Gideon's two brothers are in a city named Tabor, and the Midianites, because Gideon delayed two days, his brothers are killed in action. Now, I don't have empirical proof that if he would have obeyed, that he would have been there and would have stopped that from happening. But here's what I do know. Had he obeyed, he may have been able to save them. He may have been able to make a difference in the city of Tabor. He may have had his brothers by his side had he not delayed for two days because he doubted God. That's why it's important to note that obedience impacts us and others because God wants to bless us, but he wants to bless them through us. That's God's plan all along, by the way, for your life. He wants to bless you so that you can bless others. People are waiting on the other side of our obedience. And when we don't obey, they pay the price. They pay the price. And so Gideon, Gideon is struggling with this lie that God isn't with me. And the purpose of this lie that the enemy has in your life is to rob you of power. The power of what? The power of presence. That if God isn't with you, then you don't have that power with you. You all know the difference that presence makes. If you've ever gotten into a fight before, it's always better. You feel tough and, and tough. You feel invincible if somebody bigger is with you when you step into that fight. Uh, for me, I, when I was a kid, I used to deliver newspapers. And I, I delivered newspapers as an 11-year-old all the way up until I was 16. I could get a car and drive and, and go to another job. And, and uh, one morning, I got out there, and I was delivering papers. And I got up on somebody's porch because I cared for my customers well. And there was this, this elderly lady who was there, and she wanted her newspaper not thrown on her porch, but she wanted it up by her door and on, like, the ledge so she could just open her door and reach out and grab it. And so I did that. And as I'm up on her porch, I turn around. Her porch is kind of fenced in. The only way off of it is to the right. 
as I turn around, there's a dog that is right there. And that dog is crouched. He's hunched. And he's viciously, he's, he's baring his teeth. and He's just snarling at me. And he's barking at me. I kid you not, I stood on that porch. Every time I tried to step off, he lunged at me a little more as if I was threatening him in some way. Like, I mean, he's got this big neighborhood he could be off in, and I've got this itty-bitty porch, right? And every time I would go, he tried to bite me, and I just stayed up on that porch. I stayed there for 45 minutes. The way I got rescued was one of my customers didn't get their newspaper as they normally do, so they called the dispatch and said, hey, my paper boy skipped me, and my district manager comes out looking for me to see if I'm delivering newspapers. She sees me on the front porch, pulls up her van into that person's driveway, and saves me. She saved the day. And I'm telling you, from that day forward, I didn't want to go out and deliver newspapers by myself. My older brother, I wanted him to come with me. I wanted him, and I wanted his bat, and I wanted his friends. I wanted presents because I was, I was hoping the next day my brother's walking with me, I'm a, I, I wish that dog would show up. I wish he would. I wish he'd bark at me and snarl at us. We're going to beat him, right? Like, there's power in presence, and the enemy doesn't want you to experience the power of God's presence in your life because, man, we're not just talking about the power of presence of a brother or a friend. We're talking about the power and presence of the Almighty God. So Satan's going to try to rob you through his lies of your, the, of your potential partnership or of your partnership, of your potential, and power. And here we see in this story, as we look at it, Gideon overcame all three of these lies. He, he overcame the fact that he, that he believed God didn't care, that God couldn't use him, and that God wasn't with him. And the way he did it, here's the key, it's one point, the only thing you need to remember today is that he decided to speak God's truth. He decided to believe what the angel had said about him, what God had said about him. The first truth, truth that he chose to believe was that you are mighty. You are mighty. Look at this, uh, Judges 6, verse 12 and verses 14. It says, the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. He didn't call him a coward. What are you doing in the wine press? He said, mighty hero. See, God sees you as you are and as you will be, not, not as you feel you are right now, not as what you've been labeled as. God sees you and your potential, and he calls you by that name. And he called him mighty hero. The Lord is with you. Verse 14, then the Lord turned to him and said, go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites, for I am sending you. Listen, God's called you too. He's called you to do the same thing, to do something for his kingdom, to make a difference in the lives of others so that they can know him. And as a Christ follower, each of you has strength. You are mighty, not because you are mighty, but because of what Romans 8, 11 says, that the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives also in you. And just as God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same spirit living in you. So you've got a power living in inside of you. And I feel like, like man, I, I feel like we're living in a generation who wants to have like a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. Paul said that this would happen to, to uh, Timothy in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, I believe. He said that this, this is going to be the season. It's time for us to stop denying the power that dwells within us. God has given us the Holy Spirit, but not only has God given us his power, the same power that raised Jesus from the bed, dead to dwell on the inside of us, but with that spirit indwelling, Ephesians Ephesians 4, 7 says that he's also given each one of us a grace gift. He's given each one of us a thing that when we do it, it's easy for us to do it. A thing that when we do it, we're a 10 at it. Out of one out of a 10, we're a 10. That strength that you have is the strength that God would say, go in the strength you have. I'm not asking you to get up on stage and preach. I'm not asking you to, 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 to do the things that scare you. I'm asking you to do the things that you do well, the things that God has gifted you to do. Each of you has a strength. And what God wants to do through you, he's already put in you. Man, that's so good. Somebody should write that down. What God wants to do through you, he's already put in you. He's given you the gifts so that you can make a difference in people's lives. That's why we run Growth Track. Now, I know we're in the middle of a pandemic, and coronavirus has kept us from meeting, so that service number two, where we usually do Growth Track, can't happen. But we figured out a way to do it online, and we believe Growth Track is still relevant. It's still important, because in step number two, you're gonna discover the way that God has gifted you and wired you. You're gonna discover that strength that God's spirit has put on the inside of you so that you can do what he has called you to do, to go in the strength 
that you have. In fact, if you'll fill out the connection card right here, right now, mark it, say, I, I, wanna, I wanna know. Sign me up for Growth Track. I'll make sure our team reaches out to you and connects with you, and we'll figure out a way to do that either over a Zoom call, over the phone. We'll figure it out because we think it's important for you to know why you're here on this earth. You are mighty, and you have God's spirit and strength in you. Second truth that Gideon tapped into is that you are a conqueror. Now listen, there's 135,000 guys going up against his 32,000 guys, right? And there's, there's still too many. There's, there's 100,000 more than they've got. And so uh, God tells Gideon, hey, listen, uh, yeah, about this. If you win with 32,000 people, people are still going to say it had to do with the numbers. It's going to say it's a man thing, like that you guys pulled this off on your own. And since I'm trying to do something here, I need you to send some of these guys home. So Gideon steps out in front of this 32,000, and he gives them the opposite speech that you would have heard in the movie Braveheart or that you would have heard in The Lord of the Rings, Return of the King, when Aragorn stands in front of the armies and, and says, that, says that the hearts of men will fail, but it is not this day. You know that speech. Like, man, I get amped every time I hear those things. That is not the speech Gideon is given. Gideon gets up in front of the guys and he goes, hey, guys, just need to tell you. Gods are against us, probably gonna die. Jake, that would be a real bummer, man. I know your wife, she'll miss you too much. Tom, you know, you've got the kids at home. Like, this is probably not gonna go well for any of us, so if you're afraid, you can go ahead and go home. <laughs> what happens is, is 22,000 of the 32,000 leave. They go home. So Gideon's got 10,000 left, right? Remember, he's tapped into this. I'm a conqueror. I'm believing. I'm mighty. I'm a conqueror. But he's got 10,000 left, and God tells him, you still got too many. He, he says, so, so if you win, people will still boast that, that man did it, not God. You need to send more of these guys home. Here's how you do it. Take them down to the water's edge and tell them to drink. And uh, there's gonna, they're going to drink two ways. Some of the guys are going to scoop water up into their hands, and they're going to lap it like a dog. So right, a dog liquor. That's how they're going to get the water. And then others of them are going to go to the water, and they're just going to put their faces down there, and they're going to drink. They're going to put their mouths in the water. What? Mouths? Well, sometimes I talk good. They're going to put their mouths in the water, and they're going to drink. And God said, what I want you to do is keep the dog lickers. Keep, keep those guys that are scooping, because when they scoop, think about this. Like, we're rationalizing this. This makes sense. They scoop the water. They're looking around. These are the Navy SEALs of the men that are left, right? These are the guys that are highly competent because they can keep their eyes up looking for enemies as they come along. So, so God says, divide them up into the two groups. And, and Gideon, of course, has to be thinking, all right, the dog, the, the, the dog lickers are probably going to go until he realized that those are the guys that he wanted. And God says, keep the dog lickers, the guys that are mum, 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 looking like that. So that's what he does. Gideon had 10,000 when he started, or when he started this water's edge. 9,700 went home, left him with 300 guys left. And in Judges 7, 7, the Lord told Gideon, with these 300 men, I will rescue you and give, victory, uh, give you victory over the Midianites. And I don't know about you. Maybe you've been in a situation like that. Maybe you don't feel like a conqueror. Maybe it doesn't look like you are currently conquering your situation. And if you continue to look at your situation and your circumstances with your natural eyes, that would probably be the truth. But as Christ followers, we're called to a life of faith, and we're called to look through the eyes that God has, and we're called to look at, at the situation through the truth that he has said about us. And in Romans 8, 37, this is what he said about us. Paul said, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. That Because we're in Christ, because we're Christ followers, we are conquerors. No matter the odds, no matter the circumstances, no matter how long it's been going on, no matter what the doctor said, no matter how bad you've been hurt, no matter what they said, no matter who you've been in the past, no matter the mistakes that you've made, you are not disqualified from God's partnership, your potential, and his power. You're just not. The spirit of God dwells on the inside of you, and therefore, you are mighty, and you are a conqueror. The third truth Gideon decides to believe, and this is where I'm gonna kind of wrap things up here, is that you are valuable, Gideon was in a situation where he was struggling to trust God, and God knew that. He was struggling with this new arrangement, and so God said, you know what I'm going to have you do? I'm going to have you go down to the camp at night, again, to the Midianite camp, and I want you to listen to what they're saying. And so Gideon does. He takes, takes one of his buddies down with him, and he goes and listens late at night. And what he hears 
is what the enemy was saying about him. And I think it's important that you understand why God wants you tuned in to the voice of the enemy because when you do, you learn that the enemy is afraid of you. They're afraid of your partnership. They're afraid of your potential. And they're afraid of the power of God's presence in your life. He's, your enemy, Satan, is absolutely afraid of these things. And so Gideon goes down to the tent, and what he hears is that one guy had a dream, and he said there was this big barley loaf rolling down the hill, and you need to understand that barley, it was an inferior kind of bread. And he says the, the barley loaf was rolling down the hill, and then it entered into our camp, and it crushed all of our tents. And the guy he's talking to says, I know the interpretation of that. The barley loaf, the inferior loaf, is Gideon, because Gideon was looked at as inferior. I mean, even if he had 35,000 men, he was still inferior uh, 32,000 men, he was still inferior to the 135,000 they had. So he says, he says, that's Gideon. And what that means is that God has given victory to Gideon. And the Bible says in Judges 7, 15, when Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed and worshiped before the Lord. Then he returned to the Israelite camp and shouted, get up, for the Lord has given you victory over the Midianite hordes. See, whatever your circumstances are today, Whatever enemy you face, I'm going to challenge you. Don't believe the lies of the enemy because you are mighty. You are a conqueror, and you are valuable to God. You say, Aaron, how do we know that? The most popular verse in the Bible, one that, that, that is put on a sign and held up at every baseball game and every basketball game and every street corner in major cities is John 3, 16. It says, for God so loved the world. It means he's crazy about you. He's crazy about you that he gave his one and only son. Now, I love you. I got three kids, and there are some days that I understand why wild animals eat their young, but there's not a day that any one of my three kids I would sacrifice for your life. But God loves you so much that he sent his one and only son. What the rest of the verse says is that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. You are so valuable to God. He so loved you and so loved me that he gave his best. So here's the point of this message. If you're gonna expose the lies of the enemy, you got to know the truth. It's the only way to fight lies in your life is to know and the truth. And the truth, what's well, found in God's word. This is why you've gotta read your Bible. You've gotta get a plan and commit to it and get into it daily, even if it's just one verse a day. We talk about doing the first 15, doing the first five minutes, reading God's word, doing first five, the next five minutes, uh, worshiping, singing a song to God, and the next five minutes, talking to him, right? But spending some kind of time in his word so that you can understand it, you can know what it says, and then apply it to yourself because once you know the truth, it sets you free. You know the truth. You'll be free to enjoy your partnership relationship with God. You'll be free to live out the potential that he sees in you. And you'll be free to experience the power of his presence in your life. And as I wrap this up, let me just tell you a few things that your Bible says about you. First of all, that you are chosen by God, that you are a new creation, that you are blessed with every spiritual blessing, that you are a child of God, that you are God's friend, that you are a fellow heir. You're a joint heir with Christ Jesus. That means that everything he's inheriting from his heavenly father, you get a piece of that action, man. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are free. You are healed. You are fearless. You are Christ's ambassador. You are redeemed and forgiven. You've been made alive. You are a citizen of heaven that you get to know God and God knows you, that God will supply all of your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus, that you are complete in Christ, lacking nothing, and so much more. We've got to learn to defeat our enemy by exposing his lies with the truth of God's word. It's just that simple so that we can enjoy his partnership, so that we can live out our potential and we can experience the power of his presence so that we can go do what God has called us to do. Amen, everybody? Let's pray. Lord, today my prayer is that you would expose the lies that we've believed. There, there are so many labels that, we have, um, that have been put on our lives that we've had nothing to do with. That we, we didn't give them permission to do that. We, we didn't ask for that. It was unfair what they said about us. It's unfair the things they continue to say about us. These lies that the enemy has spoken over us through people that we've loved and we've trusted, the people that have been in our lives from when we were way younger, even through adulthood. Lord, 
my prayer is that you would expose the lies that the enemy has put on us. Father, and that you would expose them through the light of your word. So God, as we commit to getting in your word, to opening it up daily, to reading it, Lord, teach us. Show us who we are. Expose the lies of the enemy and help us to believe your truth about us so that we can be free. Free, God. Free to enjoy our relationship with you. Free, God, to enjoy the, 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 or to live out the potential that you have for us. God, I know that you have so much for us to do, so many people for us to reach, so many needs for us to meet, and so many hurts for us to heal. Help us, God, that as we expose those lies and replace it with truth to do that. And Lord, help us to, to enjoy and live through and be strengthened by and do all you called us to do by the power of your spirit that dwells within us. God, thank you for your presence. Now, as I turn, I'm just gonna look at this camera for just a moment. Man, all that I'm talking about today, of God's plan, God's purpose, his provision, all of it is available to you today. All you need to do is simply accept the gift that God gave us in his son, Jesus. So you and I were born in our own sin. And that's not your fault. It's not my fault. It just is. Since Adam and Eve fell from the beginning of time, every man and woman has been born with a sin nature. And that sin separates us from a very holy and perfect God. But God sent his son, Jesus, to live a perfect and sinless life, to die on a cross willingly, to be murdered by his peers, and on the third day to raise from the dead again. And in that sacrifice, Jesus gave his perfect life for our sinful life. He paid a price that you and I could not pay on our best day. And with the totality of our life, living as good people as we could possibly live, we still couldn't pay for our sins. In fact, the Bible says that the wages of sin or what we earn for our sin is death. And that death being an eternal separation from God. That the way we pay back, pay God back and make up for our sins is by eternity and separation from him. And that's not God's plan for you. It's not his purpose for you. In fact, we talk about heaven and hell, and I believe that the only people that are going to go to hell are people that insist on paying for their sins themselves. The truth is, is God gave his son Jesus to pay for our sins. With his life, that single death, when he shed his blood there and died on that cross, he made a way for you and I to be forgiven, to, for us to be made new creatures, for us to be restored into relationship with God. And if you're ready to accept that gift, that's all you have to do. You don't have to pay for it, work for it, nothing you got to do. There's work God's called you for. There's work he's got for you to do. But salvation is free, my friend. There's no amount of work that you can do to earn this. Jesus paid it all already. And all you have to do is simply receive it. To say, Jesus, <coughs> be Lord of my life. I'm gonna trust you with all that I am. I'm gonna trust you with my life. I'm gonna live life the way you tell me to. And so if you're ready to do that right now, I'm gonna pray this prayer and I want you to repeat after me. But before you do that, if you're here in our online campus, click that banner on your screen that says, I'm raising my hand right now to say yes to Jesus. Do that now, be bold so the rest of us can see that you're making a commitment. We're gonna celebrate with you anyway. So do it, push the button, raise your hand and say, pray this prayer after me. Say, Jesus, I need you. Forgive me of my sins. Make me brand new. Show me how to live for you. Fill me with your spirit. Today and every day hereafter, I want to enjoy you, knowing you, walking with you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I mean, if you prayed that prayer today, we are so excited for you. I know that people in the chat rooms are, are whooping and hollering and uh, are, are, are cheering you on as well. Thank you so much for on this Independence Day weekend, making a commitment to follow Jesus. Now, if you made that commitment, I'm gonna ask one thing, is that you click this connect card button that's up here. If you're in uh, on our Facebook, just scroll to the top of this. There's a description there that you can click connect. Um, but we would love to know that you said yes to Jesus. And if you'll fill that out and send us your info, we'll make sure that you get a Bible. We'll make sure that you get connected with your next steps and make sure you even get connected with the church. It's super important. So if you don't live in our area, we'll help you find one that, uh, that would be a great church in your area, wherever you live. So let us help you on your spiritual journey. We wanna be part of it. Amen, everybody? All right, well, like I said, as we wrap up, I've got a couple things to share with you. First of all, uh, if you're in a watch party, those things are awesome. Make sure you share that. Take some pictures, share that online. 
the, the, the watch parties are really awesome, a great way to fellowship. You can register uh, right now. A link should be being posted there, but you can also go to our website, mysimple.church, and uh, find a way to sign up for the available watch parties that are there. And in the very near future, uh, we're going to make it so that you can host your own watch party and invite people to uh, watch Simple Church Sunday morning services wherever you are in the world. How exciting is that? I uh, also want to remind you, the feeding program is still going. We'll go through the end of the summer, and we need people, three people a day, to help us serve those kids. And uh, so the uh, registration for that is, of course, on our website, but it's being posted now in each of our chat boxes. You can click that link, find a date that's available, and you can register. Make sure you register, because if you try to show up uh, here at the church, we don't serve here at the church. We actually serve on-site in that community, and signing up gets you an email that will tell you everything you need to know about where to be and what time to be there. So having said that, I love you guys so much. I hope you have an incredible week. I love you, love you, love you. Happy Independence Day weekend. And we'll see you right back here for a continuation of our summer series next Sunday. God bless you. Are you still here? Holy cow. Man, I almost let us walk away without taking uh, one of the greatest opportunities we have to uh, demonstrate our love and worship to God. And that's through our tithes and our offerings. And so let me just say this. I've already given you announcements. I even said go ahead and go. But let's hope you're still here. And uh, thanks for hanging out. There are ways to give right here on this screen popping up in front of my face. And uh, you can give online, you can mail a check-in if you'd like to. Whatever the Lord is leading you to do, you can also give through text to give or on our Simple Church app. Lots of ways to do that. Thank you so much for your faithfulness and for giving the way that you do, uh, especially through this pandemic. It has been incredible the way that God has showed up. We love you guys, and now we'll see you next week. <laughs>